New Testament lesson this morning comes from John 19, verses 23 to 27. John 19, verses 23 to 27. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. And this was to fulfill the scripture, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please please turn to Exodus 2 today. As once again we say, uh, uh, happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers and uh, how grateful we are for you and we thank you for your unfailing love and your faithful service to our Lord Jesus Christ. My mother went to heaven about uh, a little more than two years ago and I miss her very much. I always thought she was a very beautiful uh, woman, uh, physically and and, physically. Spiritually, except when she got mad at me, she wasn't quite as beautiful then. But um, <clears throat> our mothers are precious to us, are they not? I never forget the time I had a dream. Some of you know this story about my mother. I was just a little boy, and I dreamed that uh, for some reason she lost her two front teeth, and I was so. I, in fact, I cried in my dream. I wept and wept because her beauty was. Ruined, and uh, just this, you know, this dark gap where those two front teeth should have been, and, uh, and I kept telling her not to smile, stop smiling. And she just keeps smiling everywhere she went. This is a terrible gap there, and uh, I was so relieved when I awakened. And the first thing I did was go check out and be sure she had those <laughs> two front teeth. <laughs> so our mothers are beautiful, whether or not they have their two front teeth, and um, you be sure and. And tell them that and watch them uh, glow as you do so. Jesus honored his mother, as David read earlier, throughout his life and right to the very end. And even in the worst moment of his life, he honored his mother. Well, let's pray and we'll read Exodus 2, verses 1 through 10. Love to the loveless shown. Who are we, Father, that you would uh, show such love to us that we might lovely be? And so we thank you. Uh, for your unfailing love, uh, your mercies that are new every morning, your faithfulness that's great to your people. Bless us now as we look to your word that we may keep your commandments and honor our mothers and our fathers that our days may be long uh, upon the land that you give us and that you may be pleased uh, by the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could not hide him, you remember Pharaoh had ordered that all the boys be thrown into the river and drown. That's the context here. I should have told you that. When she could hide him no longer, she took, him, took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. 
When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and, and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Let's start with a pop quiz. Uh, you can't, can't uh, consult the internet on your cell phone. That's not allowed. You can't uh, consult your concordance. And you don't have to answer me. just want you to raise your hand if you know the name of Moses' mother. All right, we've got three, four, five. You just, you just found it, didn't you? <laughs> five, maybe six. It's not too good, people, not too good. But uh, that's why you're here today, because if nothing else, you're going to learn the name of Moses' mother, else you will not be able to have a donut this morning. <laughs> Where's Joan Guthrie? She uh, working? There she is, Joan. Nobody gets a donut today until they have... Mention the secret password, and that will be the name of Moses' mother, which I will tell you, but not till we get near the end of the sermon. So I'm going to keep you awake in here today. So, all right. We're off to a good start today. <laughs> Our mothers do just about everything for us, don't they? They, they give us life. Uh, they feed us. They clothe us. They discipline us. They nurture us. They teach us many things. Uh, For example, we learn how to become an adult when they say, if you don't eat your vegetables, you'll never grow up. We learn about the circle of life when they say, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. (laughs) We learn about the weather when they say, your room looks like a tornado hit it. I used to hear that a fair bit. We learn about the strange science of osmosis when they say, shut your mouth and eat your supper. (laughs) How do you do that? Uh, We learn about logic when we ask the simple question, why? And they say, because I said so, that's why. We learn about religion when our mothers say, you better pray that will come out of the carpet. (laughs) Most importantly, sooner or later, we all learn, and you can fill in this blank, we all learn that one great reason to honor our mothers is because if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. (laughs) Well... um, Here we meet a mama who wasn't happy in Exodus 2. It wasn't wasn't her son's fault. It was Pharaoh's fault. There were no uh, Hebrew mothers who were happy back at at this uh, period in history because of Pharaoh's evil uh, edict. Um, So several things I would point out to you about uh, this woman. First, that... She is unnamed in the text. Uh, Verse 1, a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. All we have is an unnamed man who took an unnamed woman who conceived and bore a son. And there, there aren't any names anywhere. Until finally we get down to verse 10 and Pharaoh's daughter named him Moses because she drew him out of the water. No names. And uh, we don't even have God mentioned here either, for that matter, although he's here. He's very much here, very much alive, very much at work, quietly and visibly, as he often does, having heard the prayers of his people, having heard their groaning, 
and now setting in motion the chain of events that will bring into the world the Redeemer who will rescue his people from their slavery in Egypt. Most of our mothers do their work very quietly, don't they? Kind of out of sight, kind of uh, invisibly. They're not unnamed, but they're, they're not likely to make a name for themselves, are they? Not, not in this uh, fallen world. Uh, and yet, the work of the godly mother, out of sight, you know, within the four walls of the home, as it usually is, the work of the godly mother is never in vain. She builds the foundation, and she builds on that foundation with gold and silver and, and precious stones. My mother... Uh, made me learn the shorter catechism, memorize it in the second grade. That was a thing our church did at that time. And I cried during that too. (laughs) And I just couldn't get some of that language in my head like heaven and earth and sea and all that in them is. That just didn't make sense to my little second grade brain. But she insisted I memorize it, and I'm sure I didn't memorize all of it, but I memorized more than I would have otherwise, and she was building on the foundation with gold and silver and precious stones, things that that would not return void like wood, hay, and stubble. You may have heard the name of Dr. J. Gresham Machen, great uh, scholar in the 20th century, New Testament professor at Princeton until he ran afoul of his uh, presbytery and was ousted and uh, began uh, Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia in 1929. And Dr. Machen, in his book entitled Education, Christianity, and the State, says, and just as a matter of fact, he's not boasting, but he says that he knew more biblical knowledge at the age of 14 than most of the seminary students that he later taught. And where did he learn that knowledge? He says, I did not get my knowledge from Sunday school or from any other school. I got it on Sunday afternoons from my mother at home. Gold, silver, and precious stones. As a young man of 18, his mother, and by the way, I don't know her name either, Uh, wrote him a letter and said, one thing I can assure you of, that nothing you could do could keep me from loving you. Nothing. Perhaps, she says, I worry too much, but my love for you is absolutely indestructible. Isn't that the way it is with our mothers? Her love for him was absolutely indestructible. And here's a man whose influence continues to this very day. Well, Moses' mother, who is still unnamed, uh, was unnamed, first of all. Secondly, unafraid. Verse 2, the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. Have you ever tried to hide a baby? Uh, They make noises. (laughs) They uh, cry, they get hungry, they shriek, they giggle, they blah, 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 you know, there's all sorts of unintelligible noises that babies make. And uh, they, uh, they get ear infections and they're unhappy and they, they make dirty diapers and you have to fix those things. And, uh, and then they're no respecter of of uh, persons or places. It doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing. It can be the most uh, solemn occasion. It could be a funeral service. Uh, It could be a sacred wedding. It could be in the library where everybody's studying for final exams. It could be any number of places where your child can cause you considerable embarrassment and there's just not much you can do about it. Anybody had that experience before? A few more hands this time than than uh, previously. We were we were where is Chris? There she is. We were vacationing in New Smyrna Beach one summer, and um, I think it was Norwood's restaurant, maybe. And um, I don't remember how many we had too many kids. That's all I remember. And 
we had to stand in line for an hour before we, we were able to get in there. It's a very popular place, and we were very excited about going there. And, and uh, we had a newborn who was not happy, even before we got into the restaurant. And uh, we made the terrible mistake of ordering lobster, which meant that it took a lot of hands-on work, you know, to get through the crushy, cr- crunchy stuff, the crusty stuff, to get to the good stuff. And so the kids... Uh, Anyway, it was a bad occasion. We'll leave it at that. Of all of our bad restaurant experiences with kids, it will forever rank as the absolute where we thought at one point that the patrons might take up a collection to bribe us to leave because we ruined it not only for ourselves but for everybody else. How do you hide a baby? Maybe uh, his older brother and sister helped in the conspiracy some way or another this mother was unafraid, and the clock was ticking, and the soldiers were listening and, and looking, and, uh, you know, catastrophe was just around the corner. I mean, if they, if they got found out, it could have been death not just for the boy, but for all of them. Did you ever see the movie The Patriot? Uh, if you remember that movie, there's a scene where Colonel Tavington is walking around the dining room table. It's a terrifying scene. And a little child is hiding under that dining room table inside the tablecloth. And he is just inches away from that child. That's the sort of thing that was about to happen any day in Moses' household. But this mother did not care. She was going to defy mighty Pharaoh and do everything she could because of her indestructible love for little Moses. Some of you may wonder, well, was it proper to disobey the civil authorities? You know, Paul says, submit to the authorities, Romans 13. But I suggest to you that's a qualified uh, uh, exhortation or admonition that he provides there because we have other examples in the Bible. Daniel, for example, who, uh, who didn't hesitate to defy the authorities. Or the apostles in the book of Acts when they were told by the Sanhedrin to stop preaching. They said, we can't help but preach. And uh, on they went. And so, so here we have... a. An unnamed woman, and an unafraid woman, and finally an unwavering woman, uh, unwavering faith. Verse 3, when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank, and then what? She left. How hard was that? Mothers, how hard, how hard to put your baby in a basket by the river and leave. You ever thought about that? Sort of a picture of what we see later in redemptive history when, when someone was hanging on a cross and he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the father didn't answer. He turned his back. He left his son to die and redeem us from our sins. And darkness came over the earth. And he experienced the flood of God's wrath. This woman had incredible faith to leave her baby by the riverbank. And no doubt she was praying. And no doubt she was hoping But every step away from that riverbank had to feel like a knife in her heart. I remember when uh, Kristen took uh, Kristen Faith, our oldest uh, daughter, to kindergarten, first day of kindergarten. And it was a Thursday, so I was home. And she came home sobbing. I said, what's wrong? I thought something had happened bad, you know, at the school. I couldn't understand what she was saying. (laughs) She was sobbing. Well, nothing had gone wrong. She just left the child for four hours. (laughs) This was back in the Middle Ages when they had half-day kindergarten. They don't do that much anymore, I don't think. Four hours. Four hours later, she would be right back down there to pick up the child, our daughter, and bring her home. This was a Christian school. Everything was good. It's just leaving that child. It's just the first step, you know, in the kind of letting go. It's hard. As a matter of fact, I had another friend who 
was a very successful attorney in Chattanooga and a ruling elder in the church there and later became the moderator of the entire denomination. Very <laughs> successful, influential man. <clears throat> but he, like all of us, had his own uh, parenting struggles. And uh, one day he went to, even after his kids were grown, and one day he went to see the pastor, Joe Nobinson, and he began to bewail the trials and tribulations. And Joe looked at him and said, you know, your problem is you've never learned to de-parent. He said, what's that? <laughs> well, you've got to let go. You've sown good seed. You've, you've laid a good foundation. You've put gold, silver, and precious stones. And you cannot continue to control your children. They're adults now. Trust that God will water the seed and make it to bring forth and bud. Well, that was a good word for him because it was, it was time to de-parent. <laughs> His kids were grown, but was it time for Moses' mother to de-parent three months old? Turn your back. And leave the child in the basket. Well, she had unwavering faith and did what she could Interesting that the word for basket in verse 3 is the word ark. The word ark. She made an ark. You thought Noah was the only one that had an ark, right? Wrong. <laughs> Moses had an ark too. And she, who's our ark? Jesus. Jesus is our ark who saves us from the flood of God's wrath that otherwise would come our way. And what you have here really is a picture of a mother putting her little three-month-old in the arms of her God and her Savior and entrusting, de-parenting far too soon. Everyone would agree with that. But still a woman of unwavering faith and trusting her child to God. Martin Luther once said, faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace. It is so sure and certain that a man could stake his life on it a thousand times. Well, she, whose name, by the way, before I forget, <laughs> uh, somebody tell us, one of you that raised your hand, we'll be sure you're right. Okay, Tammy. Uh, yeah, that wasn't how I pronounced it, but I, I, we'll take your word for it. Say it again. Yoshebed. J-O-C-H-E-B-E-D. Is that how you pronounce it, Wayne? Oh. <laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> the Hebrew. You're giving us a good Hebrew. Okay. You, if you say that or Jacobed or something like that, you get your donut this morning. Okay. This Jacobed, I'm going to say, had uh, staked her son's life on the ark. Not just the basket, but the, the bigger ark, her God and her Savior. Pharaoh, remember what Pharaoh had said back in chapter 1? If your Bibles are still open, look back there. Chapter 1. Verse 10, he said, Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, that is, with the Israelites. Let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Well, his definition of shrewd was murder. Just throw the boys in the river. Pharaoh found out what shrewd really is. He's no match for God. And little did Pharaoh know that right under his nose, in his own palace, in his own court, with free room, board, and tuition, was the one who would one day thwart all of his evil plans, little Moses, and, uh, and lead the people out of slavery in Egypt. Now, as you know the story, Jochebed didn't have to de-parent quite so soon after all. Uh, God's amazing providence, and she even got paid to nurse her son and raise him at home. No one really knows how long. Certainly until he was weaned, 
I mean, Pharaoh was no dummy. He didn't want to have to deal with those terrible twos. You know? So he, he let the mother deal with the terrible twos. And maybe until Moses was four or five years old, about kindergarten age, but uh, still, you know, she had to de-parent and had to let go. And so right under Pharaoh's nose was the redeemer of God's people who would lead his people, lead God's people to freedom. Where do you think Moses got the strength got the backbone later on to renounce all the pleasures of Egypt, the sinful pleasures of Egypt, to renounce his place in the court. Where did he get the determination and the backbone, as the Bible says later, to choose to suffer affliction with God's people rather than to enjoy all the pleasures that were his in Egypt. He had a rightful claim to the crown, by the way. But he left all that aside. Where did he get the strength to do that? I don't think he got that from his Egyptian tutors. I think he got it from his mother, who in a very short period of time, two years to five years, she had to parent. She did something very, very special and instilled something very special in little Moses, a woman whose name we didn't know 20 minutes ago. Everybody got it now? Jochebed. By the way, you know Moses' father's name? You get two donuts today if you know the father's name. What'd you say? Amram. Yeah, two donuts for you. Um... So an unnamed, unafraid woman of unwavering faith and courage. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, your word and thank you for this good time we've had together this morning. We thank you for the sweet fellowship that your people enjoy, for the assurance of your love for us, for the families that you've given to us, and uh, uh, for the many tokens of your grace and favor that you so generously and freely lavish upon us. Oh, we bless you, Lord, and, and thank you for this picture of Christ that we have here once again, our ark, uh, who, who saves us when all seems lost. Uh, oh, Lord, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And we, we are lost apart from you, for we can do nothing. But we thank you for being our, our great salvation. How shall we escape if we neglect it? So as we come to your table now, we pray that you would feed and nourish us, that we may continue to be strengthened and encouraged in our faith through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.